consultant clinical psychologist who works in HMP Whitemore in Cambridgeshire, which is a high secure prison. Uh, we hope to be doing some research with, with Naomi shortly. Uh, Naomi was one of our uh, speakers in a recent uh, debate on gender issues at UCL on a toxic masculinity subject. Uh, she's going to talk to us today about uh, her work with uh, sex offenders, uh, men with severe personality disorders, psychopathy, and should be very insightful. Thanks a lot, Naomi. I also just want to thank Stina who contributed to this paper, collecting, frogging through lots and lots of prisoner files, collecting the data together. Um, I'd just like to say a little bit about the project that I work on. Some of you might remember the uh, Labour government's DSPD initiative, Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder Programme. And we were the first pilot site for that project, although the initiative has subsequently been rebranded the Offender Personality Disorder Pathway. And I, I guess the main impetus behind the initiative was to try and engage people in treatment who were either precluded from um, attending the typical offending behaviour programmes that were run in prison, or weren't really motivated to, att to attend treatment. I've worked there since 2003, and along with my colleague Desmond Bay, who's also here, uh, we were responsible for devising the treatment programme. And I'll, say, I'll come say a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, but we've both previously worked in health and prison settings with people with a diagnosis of personality disorder. And I suppose it was clear, it was just very much common sense, that the treatment for the men that we were um, employed to work with, uh, we took it granted that we would need to focus on the childhood experiences, the adverse childhood experiences of, of this client group, and really didn't make a very good deal about it. And it's only since then that we realised that that actually wasn't the case. So this paper is a very crude um, attempt to make this transparent to others. I'm sure that I'm not really, I'm, you know, I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted here generally, but what I'd like to do is leave you with some examples um, to further your discussions with others. And I guess this uh, presentation could have had the alternative title of you'll hear what you're willing to hear, but that isn't the whole, the whole picture. So let's talk a little bit about the context for that. So the, the media attention, um, also the discourse that's around um, male prisoners and their offending, and also the type of treatments provided and um, the reports that typically come into our service. As I said, the notion of male prisoners having a history of adverse child, child experiences, so things like abuse, neglect and periods in care, seemed to me to be common sense, but I found myself often in conflict with society and even other mental health professionals, and other mental health professionals working with exactly the same kinds of prisoners, but perhaps in slightly different settings, with a real rubbing point. And society doesn't really seem to have an issue with the idea that female prisoners have traumatic histories. So these are fairly typical um, news stories where the newspaper, the you know, mainstream news, newspapers draw attention to the females' histories of trauma and abuse. And another one. This one, which is more generically talking about prisoners, is, is much, much rarer. Um, and actually it's really difficult to find anything in the media about males and their histories of trauma and neglect. But it's not just about the media, these are quotes that I've heard um, other mental health, health professionals make, psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, they're just a smattering of quotes from conversations, some of them fairly recent, uh, but stretching over the years. I'm not sure they're even the most, um, the most dramatic. And then of course there's the types of prison-based treatments, um, so things that are commissioned or, or run in prisons generally. 
So they're referred to as what's typically available within prison is referred to as courses and programs. And I haven't yet heard people talking today about the language that's used. And maybe there's something about engaging men where if you make it sound like education, it's going to sound a little bit more appealing. Um, what, what isn't generally offered is therapy. Maybe the language is designed to frighten men away, but I think it is not to frighten men away, but I think if that's the case, there's something a little bit patronising uh, to men, and also it means the work that needs to be done. So it creates the sense of if we teach people and educate them about their, the issues that they have, that somehow things will be different, which, which diminishes really the extent of the problems that the men have that, that find themselves within our service. So typically what's available is a, a manualised CBT-based programme, very much working in the head and addressing the symptom rather than the underlying cause, um, either focused um, explicitly on the particular offending behaviours, so the men are clustered together in groups uh, designed to address sex offending um, or violent offending, with, without any thought being given to the fact there's some overlap between those, or aimed at people who are considered to be psychopathic. There is group therapy available, uh, places like Rendon and Dovegate, and actually in those services it's much more possible to talk about the history of trauma, but it does have to be done within a group setting. And some of this is probably because the, the main group of staff delivering psychological interventions in prisons are fact forensic psychologists who don't have a background in therapy. Um, so their background is in risk assessment or, develop, or delivering manualised interventions, but they're not really um, trained in working as a therapist. So there's no requirement for prison-based services to be trauma-informed, a real lack of knowledge, lack of discussion about trauma, particularly within men's services. And I think in, in female services, much more um, dialogue about the need for these things to be addressed. And most of the people that work within uh, male prisons delivering psychological treatments are female staff and that's not to and who are often very young so I, I went to work at Whitemore when I was 33 and I was one of the oldest uh, by a long way in terms of the staff group and there's nothing I'm not trying to diminish the contribution of the female staff because uh, the women play an absolute excellent role but in terms of balance diversity life experience actually we're we're not enriched as a group in terms of what we're available what we're able to offer and I think one of the presentations earlier touched, um, touched a little bit on about talking about sex, which obviously when working with sex offenders, it's important to be able to have frank and honest conversations about sex. And I think within the prison service, any discussion of sex becomes quite frightening. People assume that um, romantic relationships between staff and prisoners might arise, um, that any expression or discussion of sex by men who are offenders must automatically be about sex offending and it almost denies the men any right to have any uh, healthy sexu sexuality themselves. <coughs> the men who come into our service, these are the flavour of the history and the reports that come to us, so these are taken from reports. So, um, a man who murdered his father, which might tell you there's something wrong with him, that relationship, his, uh, his upbringing was described as his father was a bit strict. This man had spent over 20 years in prison, had multiple contacts with psychologists, probation officers, and yet that's what his life experience um, amounted to. And in fact, his father had thrown him down the stairs, which led to him being hospitalised, and also burnt his fingers under the grill uh, when he caught him playing with matches. He grew up in an ordinary working class household, was uh, taken from a report describing a man who, a boy, um, who lived in a fa his family for several children. The parents were <coughs> separated and they both moved their new partners into the house and they all lived in the house together with a lodger. I think the idea that that's an ordinary working class household says far more about the person writing the report than the actual individual. He had a typical Afro-Caribbean upbringing. Uh, this man was beaten so severely he couldn't go to school for days at a time. So again, there's a flavour of, of, of bigotry within the reports and, and how they're written. And then his first sexual relationship was at the age of 13 with a 26-year-old woman. Now, if, if the gender in that was, was reversed, people would be horrified, but somehow that's, that's accepted as that sexual contact and no further questions asked.
And again, with the, with the quote below about the precocious boy who began doing sex at age, age 10, no questions about why he was engaged in sexual activity at that age. So the reports totally minimise their experiences, and there are many, many more quotes, and again, these probably aren't the, the worst that have been written within reports about prisoners. So just a little, I'll whisper a little bit about the service. So we're a high secure prison. Uh, men come to us for five years of treatment, so very uh, long treatment, uh, very extensive, it's trauma informed and form formulation driven. So the focus in the first two to three years of treatment is very much on what happened to them as boys, what was their experience, because it, that's, it, that's um, across the board, that, that is the kind of experience they've had. And the offending is, in, is addressed in the latter stages of, of treatment. We all have an individual therapist for five years, and the therapist is typically, um, that's allocated to them, is the same gender as the person that they, mostly they're in for murder or very, very serious violent offences. And we would tend to give them a therapist that's the same gender as their victim because we would see that relationship as being more likely to elicit the problems that they have um, in relationships. Luckily for us, most of the therapists are uh, female because most of the men within our service have offended against women, but that's, that's probably about kind of like two thirds of them. When they start treatment, they initially start with psychoeducation, kind of approaches that we think are kind of a bit gentler, so there is this kind of emphasis on, on trying to teach at that point, trying to understand the diagnosis they've been given, trying to understand why, why most of the work that we do is in groups, because ultimately, uh, man, man's a social animal, and it's important for them to have a sense of uh, camaraderie, as we spoken about earlier, and the prisoners are encouraged to make bonds with the other seven men in the group that they're, they're in the group with. And the whole group will pass on a journey together. Um, the material that we use is, is that, although we, we might use some PowerPoints and some of the semi structured groups, just to make sure that the therapists cover um, the topics that we want covering, what we try to do is make sure that there isn't a requirement for a particular level of literacy. Um, the, you can see um, there what groups we're offering, uh, but all of their groups are running the same, the same group, and they stay in the same group from the start of treatment to the end. The groups consist of men who've committed primarily violent offences, as well as men whose index offence might have been sexually violent. So that's pretty unique within the prison system. And I think uh, two things that really stand out are the key role that prison officers play in treatment. So we've uh, got a group of prison officers here, uh, here today. But they work in the groups alongside the psychologists and psychotherapists. And I think that group is primarily uh, male, often ex-military, and often have quite a burly front about them. But I, I guess as role models, what they do is role model that there are different ways to be masculine. And they talk about vulnerability, they talk with the prisoners about being frightened when the prisoner kicks off. Uh, and role modeling that it's actually safe and it's acceptable to be male, but also talk about things like fear or sadness. And we also share information across the staff group, so um, within the treating team, so people won't be gossiped about and they will be spoken about with other prisoners, but um, the, the wing has three spurs, each of which has its own multidisciplinary team, and if somebody's speaking with me, an individual therapy, about being sexually abused by their mother, I would share that with the staff group because it's important for them to know that about the individual. I'm documenting and uh, really doing kind of like an audit of the kinds of traumas that people had experienced during childhood, but also uh, whether there were any significant trauma in adulthood. Um, and the individual therapist would fill in a, a form um, at the year, first year's CPA, uh, the review that happens about treatment. And partly that was about counting what's happened um, so we could describe the, the population a bit better, but also to make sure that we weren't missing out some of the things that might need to be treated during the course of treatment. And what Sabrina then did has been back over looking at each of the, um, the reports that came with the prisoner when they were admitted to our service and looked at how much of that information we knew during the assessment process and, and, how, and then we were able to compare that with what we know when men have been in treatment. So for 62 prisoners, 
Um, you can see there that, that 43 of them have a report written by a psychiatrist, 58 by a psychologist, and 44 by a professional that were available to us, certainly, um, during that period. And lots of them have had um, several reports, so they may have had a psychiatric as well as a psychological report. In terms of the quick uh, demographics of the population, mean age of about 43, uh, the age of them has come down over time. I think when the service first opened, what we got was lots of men over tariff who'd been in prison for perhaps 25, 30 years. Um, and although we're a volunteer, they, they have to volunteer to come to our service, they can't be um, they can't be forced into it from another part of the prison state. Typically what happens is, is it's identified as a treatment need for them on a parole hearing and so they feel they have no choice whatsoever. Um, mainly white, 17% um, mainly, 17% um, of the population, um, mainly the men with um, African or Caribbean heritage. Um, we've had a couple of Asian men pass through the service, um, but this, this would, it, that doesn't really reflect the prison population as, as such. Um, but that is quite standard for personality disorder services. I was really impressed to hear the uh, presentation this morning from the even though it's quite different. Many of them are considered to be high secure. The psychopathy score um, is significant in that a cutoff of 26 within the UK and 30 in America is considered to mean that the individual is psychopathic um, and they're seen as being particularly difficult to treat. In fact, lots of research to suggest that treatment might make them worse. Um, but I think that really tends to be drawn from research that's based on more intellectually driven programmes. And they're considered to be at high risk of re-offending. And you can see there what their main diagnoses are in terms of... They have to have a diagnosis of personality disorder to get into our service um, or be considered to be psychopathic. But lots of other mental health um, symptoms that go alongside those diagnoses. And there you can see what their main offences are. So they're all men who come to very serious um, offences, often offended in prison, often um, there's something perhaps a bit bizarre about their offences, so perhaps dismemberment of, of body, um, or also offending against strangers. So in terms of, obviously, a very crude measure in terms of we haven't used definitions um, of each of the categories that we were collecting. Um, it's possible that the reports that came to us from other services, the individual who was writing them was, was trying to protect the confidentiality of the, pris of the prisoner, but then it would suggest that they didn't consider it important to hand over that the person was sexually abused, they didn't consider that important in terms of the treatment. Um, and I think it's possible that our staff also didn't probe some areas as thoroughly as others. So if somebody spent a lot of time talking about his involvement in a paedophile ring, it's likely that something like bullying or poverty would have been spoken about so extensively. So, so actually our data is probably also a representation, a representative. So you can see here, um, I guess the first column on the left on a bit, there's numbers followed by the percentages. And you can see here, that actually the amount of information that we end up knowing about the prisoner um, is dramatic, was statistically significantly different in most categories. And some of that might be partly because we have the members this for so long and have so much therapeutic contact, but you have to bear in mind that many of these men have come from places like Broadmoor or Rampton. They've spent a lot of time in the healthcare and segregation units. They've had a lot of contact with mental health professionals. So I don't think that explains the whole, the whole story. Again, there you can see kind of like parental separation and hospitalisation, um, being bullied. And then in terms of adult, adult trauma, I don't have the, the significance of that, but you can see that even there we can see differences in terms of people reporting can we work to sex workers or be a victim of sexual assault in adulthood, which they haven't previously felt able to, to disclose. So why have we got so much more information? from the length of time in our service, as I've said, I think there was an awful lot of discussion about abuse and neglect in our unit. 
um, the prisoners understand that that is the norm in terms of their histories. Uh, we don't, as I said already, we don't keep secrets between the therapists and the prisoners, so we extend that knowledge to the rest of the treatment team. So actually, prisoners are encouraged to share their history, histories within the group. And over time, they become very accustomed to having discussions elsewhere. They often have discussions with the prison officers in between sessions. Uh, the prison officers really taking a role that's not dissimilar to uh, nursing assistants within ward settings. So often having really psychological conversations, providing an awful lot of emotional support and containment to men who are really struggling to cope with uh, the effects of trauma. Prisoners who've been there longer are very open about their histories of abuse. They write poetry about their therapeutic journey and their experiences of abuse and they display that on, on the wall uh, throughout the environment. And they, they can kind of guess what's going on for people. So if you've got a guy who's down the gym all the time, really beefy, you know, what that says to most of us within the service, the prisoners included, is this is a man who's really frightened. Um, so actually people start having conversations in a very direct way with the prisoners, which perhaps on other occasions people have shied away from. And as I've already said, the operational staff role model that it's possible to talk about being vulnerable and still manly, it doesn't have to be emasculating. And I think there's also um, a sensitivity of female staff to how we're likely to be perceived as a threat. So at one point we looked at the data and found that of the men who've been sexually abused, 54% have been sexually abused by a woman. So actually if someone's coming into a therapy session with a female therapist, it has to be on the table to talk about that individual is likely to be frightened in the therapy session. And there's a tendency for us to assume that as psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, uh, as a mental health professional, that because we're in the role of helping, that we want to help, that that's how we're seen uh, by the people that are trying to offer help to. That, you know, the reality is, it was authority figures often who've abused them, and so ultimately we're the most frightening person for them to have to get in a room with. We have some men who don't want to, to do individual therapy, would rather do groups, and then we also have a lot of men who would rather do the individual therapy and not want to do the groups. There's also something about asking the right questions and being, and being direct in a way that it's possible to talk about what happened. So rather than asking, were you sexually abused, asking what age did you first have any sexual contact at, and, and how old was the person that you had the sexual contact with, so rather than labelling it as a, you know, in our society we all know that the idea is that men are always up for sex at all times and they never decline it and, it's hard, and it can be hard to say yes if you're asked if you're abused. I think also you need to be willing to hear and pick apart what you're seeing. So uh, these comments are fairly typical comments that have come from um, therapy sessions. So, they mirror the reports, the reports from earlier. So the idea that it's normal, the idea that that's just what black families do to their kids, um, euphemism, so having your tummy tickled being a euphemism for, for oral sex, the idea that your parent would beat you because they care about you, or actually that being in a care of the local authority is actually a good thing because you get three meals. It, you know, it's something really dreadfully sad that that's the yardstick that people measure their lives with. So being willing to, to see and challenge the bigotry and stereotypes. Um, I mean, Ben spoke of, Ben Hines spoke about attitudes, and I think that's that's important in terms of uh, working with men, being willing to apply the same standards of care we give women. And actually, if having sex as a child uh, with somebody who's twice your age is abusive for women, then also that was abusive for, for a little boy. I think also we, so I think somebody else touched earlier on the importance of being able to see the child. It's very easy when you've got a very aggressive man who's beefing up in the gym to feel frightened and see the offender or you read about the horrendous index offence. But actually there is the, the hurt child in the person that was there and it's really important to be able to look for that and see that part of the person. And I think also a requirement for therapists to authentically like their patient. Um, Quite often in forensic practice, it's not that it's not that unusual to hear people say, "I don't like, I don't have to like him um, to establish a working relationship." But actually, if you want the person to feel safe with you, to be able to open up to you, then you absolutely do have to be able to care about the patient. Uh, within our service, it's acceptable to talk about the challenges and the barriers to liking somebody, 
um, that maybe there's something about how they present themselves that makes them quite repulsive to start off with, but that would be spoken about openly with the individual, that that is a barrier that needs to be over overcome, because that's probably quite a standard reaction to the individual. papers that support the idea that female prisoners have this history of trauma and neglect and abuse and that have specialised treatment needs but more recently there has been research that's found that actually the experiences of men are not that dissimilar to, to women. There's a really interesting study by Tabitzis, I think et al, I'm not sure if I pronounced that name correctly, but found that the, for boys environmental instability, childhood externalising behaviour and then adolescent peer social skills. So either being a loner in teenage years or gravitating towards gangs um, was associated more with acting out violently. And also boys tend to act out at a younger age um, and more quickly after their victimisation, whereas um, girls tended to delay their, their acting out behaviour. So in summary, irrespective of whatever treatment needs the female prisoners have, male prisoners need interventions that address and avert adverse childhood, childhood experiences. And I think there isn't enough dialogue about this, so it's frustrating to hear services being set up where actually that isn't a big priority. Somebody might decide that they have a, an interest in that, I might wish to, to include it, but it's not necessarily a requirement of a service being set up, which you know, it seems like we're letting, letting them down.